Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the coffee break. Now we are going to continue with a panel on how specifically the MSCA can foster the connection between science and, and policy. There are very interesting examples, success stories that we can mention, like, for example, the Intergovernmental Partner for Climate Change, IPCC, or, for example, Oficina C, which is the office that provides advice to the Spanish Congress of Deputies. But, of course, there are also a lot of barriers, challenges that we still need to overcome. So we have put together a panel that will discuss both these aspects, challenges and opportunities. And I would like to introduce the panelists. By the way, the title of the panel is How is Science Contributing to Shape EU Policy in its Mission to Confront Global Challenges? So the moderator of the panel, I invite you to come on stage, is Connor O'Carroll, founder and director of CIPOL Services LTD Ireland, independent consultant on research and higher education focusing on research career development. Uh, he led and helped several European initiatives on doctoral education, and he's the author of a recent book, towards a global value system in doctoral education. The speakers are Isaz Kunlakunza, uh, Director of Science for Policy at the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology. She has a PhD in chemistry, and she coordinates Oficina C, this Office of Science Advice to the Congress of Deputies that I mentioned before. Then we have Maria Jose Sanz. She's the Science Director of the Bus Center for Climate Change. She has a PhD in ecophysiology, and she has been author and editor of several IPCC reports. Uh, she uh, has leading roles in uh, organizations like the Global Forest Observation Initiative and the European Union Joint Program Initiative on Climate. And finally, Claire Morel, head of unit in charge of the Maris Wodoska Curie Actions uh, at the Directoral General of Education, Youth, Sports and Culture at the European Commission. She has had past responsibilities on the Erasmus Plus program and in, relation of, and in the relation of Europe with Eastern neighboring countries and Central Asia. So throughout this event, there will be plenty of opportunities to ask questions, make comments, debate, etc. So when the moderator will allow for it, I invite you to raise your hands and uh, wait for a microphone in order to have your question uh, streamed online. But since we have online streaming, we also have another possibility to post question, which is through Mentimeter. So you have a Mentimeter QR there, both for the people that is in the room and especially for the people that, are, uh, uh, that is uh, following via the streaming. And at the end, of the session after the live questions, I will take care of uh, posing the questions that come through the Mentimeter. So enjoy the panel. Well, thank you very much, Michele. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, panelists. I think I've been to quite a number of Marie Curie conferences. And in fact, I'm a Marie Curie fellow myself. I did my PhD at a time when there were still individual doctoral fellowships. But this is the first time where one of these conferences has moved beyond looking at, let's say, the mechanisms of the program, of whether it will be better to increase the number of doctoral candidates funded or individual fellows. And the program itself, as has been outlined earlier on, by both um, Antoinette and Raquel, that it's, it, 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 sometimes it had the name of the, the bottom-up program, it was a mobility program, but I think the fundamental point, which is really important in this program, it is based on research excellence. No Marie Curie fellow, no Marie Curie scheme is funded unless it's founded on cutting-edge, outstanding research across all disciplines. And of course, in that sense, I believe, it gives this program and the researchers funded under this program a great advantage and a great opportunity to contribute to global challenges across all areas, whether it be climate change, whether it be issues of pandemics, whether it be issues of social importance. So today, we're going to discuss this, and we're going to look at specifically at Marie Curie in the context of global challenges themselves. So what I'm going to do, go back to our 
panel, and I'm going to ask each one of them to tell us a little bit more about themselves in the context of what they're doing and how it might relate to this. So, Isaskun, I'll pass to you first. Thank you, Connor, and good morning, everybody. Well, as uh, Michele said, I am one of the coordinators of the Science and Technology Office of the Congress of Deputies here in Spain, of our parliament. And this service was set up in 2021, but it was a very long journey, and I'm, I, I will have the time to tell you a little bit about the intra history of how we achieved uh, the, the office in 2021. And the service that we are offering is very easy to say and very difficult to achieve, probably. What we are trying to do is to better connect scientific evidence with the policy making in our parliament. And equally important, important for me at least is the other way around. We are trying to better connect the policymakers' concerns with our research community. We are a team of... Sorry. So how we do that? We are a team of seven researchers, and I will tell you a little bit later about the recruitment process because I think it's a, of interest for, for the topic of the conference, plus two clerks at the parliament. And what we do together with our advisory board is to present to our parliament every year a list of topics that the research community considers of essence for the country in the next five to ten years. Out of this very first proposal from the research community, our parliament chooses four to six very relevant topics for them, and it's in that moment in which we start working in putting together reports which are, which are completely interdisciplinary and contextualized in the socio-political context of our country, trying to uh, offer the state of the art of research in a given topic. We are working in misinformation in, in the digital era, uh, fires in Spain, uh, neurodegenerative uh, diseases, you name it. All sorts of topics that are of interest for, for our country. As you can imagine, the seven researchers that are working there are no experts of every single topic of that. And this is part of the beauty of what we are doing because we are somehow being an interface in between the research community and the policymakers. The way we do this report is by extensively reading the scientific literature and the policy documents around the topic and with interviews to between 15 to 20 uh, researchers on the, topic, on the topic, the best researchers on that particular topic from all kinds of disciplines. And with that, we put together, as I say, a report that tries to be accessible yet very rigorous uh, to our policymakers. And we presented those reports in the parliament in public exercises, streamed so that the public can see them. But also we facilitate private dialogues in between researchers and our members of parliament. Our office facilitates that dialogue. And these are probably the most fruitful discussions because it's you know, closed doors and you can have open, honest discussions about, about the topic. And we also do some pairing schemes. We put together uh, members of parliament with researchers because one of the things that we want to do is also work on the human side because sometimes it's a matter of prejudice that you know, researchers don't, don't approach uh, parliamentary, par parliamentarians and the, and the other way around. And basically this is how we work. Thank you very much, um, Isasco. And I think it's really interesting because if you remember when Lorenzo, he was talking about politicians and how they interact with scientists, but by getting that link directly, by building it up, it, I think it can be really valuable in that context. Maria Jose, would you like to tell us a bit more about something more, let's say, practical that, that you're involved in, in terms of? Thank you, Conor, and thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, well, um, I think because we are talking about careers, maybe I can illustrate my career first. Um, I was starting to work with policymakers very early in my career. During my PhD, I was working on a very important environmental case in Spain, which was one the impacts of one thermal, big thermal power plant um, uh, in the ecosystems. And that was um, a project where we managed to get policymakers, scientists together and provide solutions. Solutions on how to monitor, solutions on how to desulfurize de the emissions and, and so on. And it was a quite successful case. So that was the local, regional level. Um, and, and then I also contributed later on as a postdoc um, to, for example, um, the science evidence for the air pollution uh, directives of Europe and the US uh, that resulted in air pollution directives, the ones that we have now. 
and the ones that uh, help to reduce uh, or improve air quality in Europe, but also in the in the U.S. So I, I had a quite close relationship with policymakers, and and at one point in time, I thought, well, may, maybe my problem is that I don't understand fully the challenges that the policymakers are having and how to communicate these things to society better. So I started a period in my career where I. I uh, was a mediator uh, in uh, multilateral uh, negotiations at the UN. And there I discovered that uh, uh, my, my environment in Spain or in Europe was, was far uh, you know, less diverse than the world is. And you really need to understand cultures, behaviors, beliefs in order to be able to dialogue, to mediate, and, and also to provide solutions that are prone to the context where the solutions need to be implemented. And in this uh, context, I also contributed uh, a lot um, to IPCC. I've been, I've been working on IPCC reports since 2003 um, until, until now, until the last cycle. And at the moment, I am a member of the Task Force Bureau for the seventh cycle. I mean, IPCC is in a very interesting space because it allows scientists to get together and discuss and openly tell what are your beliefs, your evidence, how you interpret uh, the data you have, and then get consensus about how these interpretations and how you can shape the hypotheses and provide uh, solutions and means uh, for the policymakers to understand um, the scientific evidence. Of course, I mean, IPCC is very clear in the fact that we are not policy prescriptive. I mean, I think, um, you know, Melchor said something very um, um, to the point in, the, in his speech. We are honest brokers. We have to be honest brokers because it's not our, our uh, function to provide the solution that the policymakers need to adopt. Because it's not only our information what matters. It's not only our knowledge what matters to implement and you know, define the final solution. Sometimes we have very good technical solutions. We can be uh, you know, perfect in the sense of that we have the technology, uh, we have uh, what we believe is the best solution for a particular uh, problem in the context of uh, climate change, uh, but uh, then there are obstacles, there are barriers. We need the knowledge of other uh, brokers, that it can be even the citizens themselves that can provide the knowledge which is necessary to implement these technical solutions. Now in IPCC, there is also a much more uh, integration of social science, which I think it was needed. Uh, I mean, it was, it was starting with economy, but now we have also other very important disciplines, like for example, psychology, uh, behavioral psychology is becoming a very important uh, discipline in the context of the discussions of the IPCC. And I believe that for the seventh cycle, we are really going to you know, turn around the point and see how uh, you know, we can get closer to the challenges and uh, you know, understanding better the context. Because we can downscale global solutions and pretend that those will work at the local level. This has to be done in other way. So I think this is what uh, we are trying to do at the global level at the moment. And this has to percolate into the other scales as well. So the, the center where I am now uh, and why I came back to Spain was because I thought we need to put in the same space with enough time many disciplines. They need to change their mindsets because they need to work together. And it, as you may know, because you are all, or many of you are scientists, that's not so easy. It's not so easy to put different scientists in the same room that are coming from completely different mental schemes in terms of disciplines and make them to work together. So what we are trying to do in BC3 is exactly that. And um, you can do that uh, just in theory. You, can do, you have to do that in practice. So this is what we are doing also. We are trying to find ways, avenues to co-produce, to you know, support uh, policymakers uh, with real cases. And we have been working, for example, on the energy transition in Spain. We are also working a lot on cities. Uh, we are working on land use issues, trying to co-produce uh, you know, um, territorial visions with different stakeholders uh, to see what are the best policies that uh, may apply to these cases and what are the obstacles, what will be the enablers uh, that will allow those policies to be deployed and fundamentally, if there are any distributional impacts that can be foreseen, so that will allow to put the, you know, the lever into the policy that will, uh, will reduce the distributional impact and uh, enhance uh, the adoption. So, I mean, in a nutshell, this is what um, I can say about what we are doing. Thank you, Maria Jose.
Claire, you're far closer to Marie Skudowska Curie, so tell us a bit more. Yes, well, thank you, thank you, Connor, and uh, good morning to all. Indeed, my link to the Marie Skudowska Curie action is quite uh, direct and obvious. I'm the head of unit in charge of these actions at the European Commission, in the Directorate General responsible for education, culture, youth, and sport. And uh, we are uh, working closely with the research executive agency. So I'm here with colleagues, both from the, the, the Directorate General, but we also have a colleague from the research executive agency. And the role of my unit is to define the policies, to define the uh, priorities of the program. We do this through what we call a work program, where we define those policies and we discuss them uh, with the representative from the member states through what we call a program committee meetings. Plus, we have regular discussions with stakeholders, with the alumni association, with umbrella organizations uh, during events like this. And every year, we're trying to improve our policy through this uh, work program, which then um, develops into the calls to which you have participated and the different actions. And um, one of them, my objective today, uh, as, as uh, Connor said, is that there are still quite a lot of misconceptions about what the MSCA is about. MSCA is not only a mobility program as it's sometimes uh, presented, um, and it's not, uh, it has an impact not only on individual researchers, but also on organizations that are taking part in it, because the, uh, the good, the, let's say, the good practices which are um, implemented through MSCA are also spread through the organizations and beyond. So I think uh, the MSCA has really an effect on uh, good practices much beyond the, 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 the projects which, which it funds. Um, I'd like also to, uh, to say that uh, the import, uh, events like this has import, are important because, as I said, we get feedback and we regularly uh, improve uh, the, the, the program. And also another misconception is that we are a bottom-up program, so we are not contributing to policies or priorities of the EU. And I hope that we will manage today, me, my colleagues, to prove just the opposite. Sometimes I read statements like, despite being a bottom-up program, MSEA contributes to uh, global challenges. I would say it's thanks to being a bottom-up program, it can contribute to all uh, global challenges. And this is what um, I would try to... Uh, uh, to, to prove uh, today, and I think this is what also the introductory uh, statement this morning have, um, have, uh, have proven as well. Thank you very much, Claire. I'm going to go back to Lorenzo's presentation. You're, you're, like, you're, not, you're not out of the woods yet. <laughs> and, um, because I think some, by some of the points you made, you made a lot of excellent points. And um, I thought one thing you said about, um, you know, during COVID, where there was diverse opinions coming out from the scientific community. Well, in a sense, that was a strength because it shows how science is iterative. It's not fixed. People were doing, they were reacting very quickly, doing experiments, trying to find out new knowledge in that. But perhaps that's something that the public need to understand, and indeed politicians, that there's no absolutes, that is, you, you must always keep going. Is that good? Tell us what, what was your impressions of Lorenzo's um, presentation? Well, it was music to my ears. I think that we are completely aligned with the, uh, the vision that uh, Lorenzo presented from the GRC and all the difficulties and challenges that uh, Science for Policy has. And he made me remember a few moments in the process of putting together the Science and Technology Office and the, uh, in the Parliament that somehow you know, showed how um, researchers can have a much more active role in, in the public life and debate. And I kind of... Uh, call for it. So I, I told you that we were created in 2021, but we started advocating for a science and technology office at the parliament for four years before, because you can imagine how difficult the process it was. We had to convince all the political parties in between the process. We had new elections. You need to start convincing new people and so on. But the whole process cannot be explained without a few researchers that were in their labs and that identified a gap in our country. We didn't have a science and technology office in the parliament, and they started somehow promoting the idea that we should have one. And it all started in social media, and it was a huge reaction. All the scientific community in Spain agreed that we needed something like that. And all of a the sudden, there was you know, the agreement of hundreds of institutions, ours as well, the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology, that supported that civil movement. And this is my first reflection, right? Be 
are we sufficiently, we, I mean the research community, are we sufficiently involved in the public life, public debates of our countries, regions? I think there's room for us to be much more vocal. And I'm not talking about your specific uh, discipline of uh, expertise, but trying to contribute to, to, the, public, to the public good. And I mean, there's, uh, you, can, you can actually do it. We have a very successful story in Spain. And the other thing that Lorenzo was mentioning was the capacity building, not only is individual, but also institutional, and we witnessed that, that very much during the process of the creation of the office. Uh, so when we signed the agreement with the parliament, because uh, the, of the, the office is offered through an agreement with my institution, uh, it was two coordinators in the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology, me and my colleague, and we had a budget to hire five people. This was our budget. And it was a beautiful moment because you have, you know, you can build something from scratch as you wish, select the people you, uh, you want to be working with. It's a dream. And we were discussing what kind of uh, profiles we would need. And we agreed for sure that we needed PhDs because, I mean, the amount of scientific literature that they, were, they had to review was going to be enormous. They had to interview researchers from all disciplines, some of them very relevant, very well known. So that was an agreement. But after that, once you start profiling the type of uh, um, person or professional you would need, we realized that we were painting somebody that didn't really exist, at least in our country. At least we couldn't actually ask for any particular work experience. It was very minor, you know. Yes, we could be hiring somebody from the GRC, but we wanted to be more open. So we very soon realized that we were, as I said, profiling a professional that was pretty new in our country. So we decided to go, instead of working for too much work experience or being too picky in that, we decided to go and try to find people with the competencies we wanted. So we were pretty open in the, in the application process. We were calling for PhDs with two years of experience after their PhD in any kind of sector, and we tested them a little bit. So basically what we did was an exam in, during the application form, and we gave them six different papers, policy documents, uh, uh, but also papers and so on, and we asked them to write a policy brief in one hour time. We had over 500 applications for, uh, for five positions. And this we, uh, we interpreted as a high interest from the scientific community to be much more involved in the public, uh, in the public process. I mean, it was impressive. It, it, also, it almost killed us, the, the process itself. And uh, we have a wonderful team. Uh, and what kind of people we were looking for? We were looking for people that were super rigorous scientifically but also open enough us to be reading other disciplines from other things. I mean, I told you before, we are working in things that we are absolutely ignorant when we start working on, on that. But we are confident enough that we have the capacities, the strength, the training as, a, as researchers. But they also need to be talking to uh, members of parliament. And they also need to be writing in Spanish, because usually science is written in English, right? And we are, our reports are written in Spanish, and not only a different language, but also a different a type of, of communication. Um, so that would be another reflection. Are we fit for pur purpose as researchers, or could we be training another layer of researchers being able to do this interface? And I think that MSCA has a lot to say, to say there. And just to finish, uh, I think that Lorenzo made a very strong point, and I can only agree on that, which is this is not only on the researchers, because we try, every time we want to change something in the research community, we look at a particular researcher asking you uh, to know about open science, to know how Tokyo communicate, and so on. I am a strong believer of diversification of careers and specialization a little bit, but also on institutions taking responsibility. I think that institutional-wise, there is a huge gap to take responsibility of we need to be connecting much better with other stakeholders. And we like to think that we are promoting that in Spain with, through our scientific advisory board, because they are uh, the main institutions of our country are sitting in our uh, advisory board. And together, we are starting to learn what we are doing, because this is my last uh, um, point. We are learning. I mean, we are, me, uh, myself, and my, my, other, my colleague, my other coordinator, we know very little about the policy making process. We are learning because nobody ever in our training as researchers taught us how to do that. 
and we are you know, enthusiastic and we are training, but I wish I, I would have had much more training on policy making. Thank you, Isasco. Um, Maria Jose, what would be your reflections on Lorenzo's presentation? I think it's the first time I've been seeing all this together in a way that uh, illustrates what are the challenges and what are the beauties of uh, interfacing with policy makers. Um, and I think it was also quite uh, interesting to see how not only policy makers, but society was also mentioned somehow. Um, I, I believe that uh, uh, we need more, um, you know, more capacity building uh, in that uh, direction. Um, I think that one of the issues that we have, you know, perhaps, is first to look into our own community of scientists and uh, develop common languages. Um, as I said earlier, one of the things that I'm really missing is spaces for debates, for scientific debates, to get consensus ways to communicate complexity without losing it. Because uh, one of the challenges uh, in the pandemic was that we were trying to communicate things that were very complex and sometimes they were oversimplifications, which led uh, to uh, different understandings by different uh, people with different values and beliefs. And I think uh, we cannot afford that those days. We need to find a way to get the scientific community, the disciplines together, sort of uh, agree on how we're going to communicate things without losing the complexity, without losing the sense that science is complex. We don't know everything, but we know a lot. Uh, but what we know can contribute to improve uh, and solve problems uh, like the pandemic, like climate change, and so on. Uh, but if we don't have those spaces, what is happening basically is that we have scientists communicating different or, or uh, limited aspects uh, in isolation. And sometimes this is perceived by society and even by other scientists as uh, interpretations of the truth or uh, you know, oversimplifications that are not scientific. And I don't think we can afford that. Uh, so I believe that what Lorenzo was saying goes in the direction of creating those spaces, of creating careers where um, we have figures that are breachers, they breach the communities, they breach the disciplines, and they breach uh, the society and the science. And those profiles are, so, are as important as the pure scientists. Because without that, we won't be able to communicate properly, and we won't be able even to communicate between ourselves, between scientists. Mm -hmm. So in that regard, I really appreciate many of the points that uh, made, were made there. As I said, um, there have been global efforts to do that in climate change is IPCC, and yet we see it's quite difficult. So it's not so easy to, to build this, and, and IPCC is operating uh, for seven cycles already, or mm -hmm. four, four or five uh, years, and we are yet in the infancy of sometimes understanding each other and working together, and you know, portraying this knowledge to the society in a way that they can assimilate through a language uh, that is made by scientists, but uh, for uh, other stakeholders. Thank you. Claire. So, um, Lorenzo's presentation was, was also uh, music to my ear, in particular when you mentioned the issue of intersectoral mobility, which, as you know all, is at the heart of the, uh, the MSCA. And when we talk to, about uh, intersectoral mobility, which we promote very much through our programs, including now with financial incentive, for example, with the uh, postdoctoral fellowship, where we give the possibility to the postdoctoral researcher to have an additional six months at the end of their, their research, if they go to a non-academic um, um, sector, we have the tendency to, um, to, to say that in this uh, non-academic sector is uh, a business, it's an enterprise, it's an SME, it's industry, while well, it's much more than that. In fact, our researchers can be mobile to any non-academic organization, including administration, national, regional, local administration. And I think, as, as, as Lorenzo mentioned, this is something on which really we need to, to, be, uh, to adapt a bit our communication, because we still don't have enough uh, researchers doing their uh, mobility within MSCA um, to a ministry or, or to, to, uh, to a public, uh, a, any public administration. So I think what I take from uh, Lorenzo's presentation is that this is something that we, where we must uh, improve. And uh, talking about communication and names, we also have an, an industrial 
uh, doctoral program as part of our doctoral network. We call it industrial uh, doctorate, but in fact, it's open to any type of non-academic partner. So if any of you have a better name than industrial doctorate, I would be uh, interested to know, because it's true that we, more, I, I would say that the large majority of our industrial doctor, doctorates are uh, including partners from the industry because probably of the names, although it could, uh, it could include, it could have partners from, uh, from any ministry, public administration, etc. And it represents only a very small proportion so of, of, of uh, these uh, non-academic partners. So if you have uh, an idea of a better name, I uh, would be very interested to know. Okay, thank you. I want to wind back a bit. And to the point that if you take it from the perspective of an individual researcher, a doctoral candidate, postdoc, they're consumed with their research. They're consumed with whatever they're doing. They would usually feel quite distant from anything to do with policy. So in a sense, th there's also a need, in a sense, to convince your researchers to do this. So is asking, so why and how should researchers contribute to global challenges? Well, I mean, <clears throat> to I mean, I think that the why is obvious. I mean, there's, yes. uh, and Lorenzo made a strong point about that and how much science can contribute to these so-called weak problems. I mean, scientific knowledge can certainly contribute to addressing global challenges. And some, sometimes uh, they, science generates new problems and new policy situations that need to be, need to be addressed. So the why is, uh, the, the philosophical question is addressed. But why me as a researcher concerned with my own career should be addressing global challenges uh, or should I care about getting closer to policy makers? Um, I always call for the personal responsibility of each of us. I mean, we are doing, we are working for a reason, and I th what better reason than, than addressing global challenges? But I understand that everything is against working for, like, like that, because research is very individualistic. We were discussing it, Maria Jose and myself, and the kind of uh, knowledge yet that you want to offer to policymakers is not your research yourself. It's you know the a, a piece of work that many people have been working together, the state of the art of something. So it's a little bit against the idea of my research, my fight against my colleague, and so on. So it's intrinsically very complicated. So pr probably we need to be thinking on changing the um, incentives to be a researcher. Recently, we had a discussion with a, a so, so soon to be Marie Curie um, fellow and she wanted to work with us in the Oficina C, in the Science and Technology Office of the Congress, and we had a, a meeting with her, and I, I believe she was a microbiologist. And she was thinking on starting working with us like uh, 36 months after the discussion. And she wanted me to assure her that there was gonna be a work on microbiology in the office at that time because she's worried about her CV and so on, and I told her that's not gonna happen, I don't know. Uh, First of all, if we will be alive in 36 months, no, that's a joke. But second of all, if we, are, uh, if we keep working, um, maybe we are working on, I don't know, fake news. And you will be incorporating in a team that is working on fake news. And I, she, she, she declined our invitation. And I understand because in a way, the way we are um, uh, assessing research, it would be understood as something out of her, you know, her main CV and so on. I think that's a pity, because I mean, for that particular researcher to spend six months with us would allow her to achieve a huge amount of new knowledge, new ways of understanding how the parliament works and so on. So I certainly think that we need to be thinking on the uh, on how we are evaluating research and start changing things and acknowledging other types of contribution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Maria Jose, do you think there's enough awareness among researchers themselves as to why and should they contribute to global challenges? Well, I, I think they, they are aware that uh, one of our missions is to contribute to global challenges. I guess what they are not really aware is uh, on what sorts of means and mm -hmm. um, could be there for contributing to global challenges. And I think what you cannot 
think as a scientist is that because you're working on a tiny fraction of something, you're not contributing to a global challenge. Because the contribution to global challenges, it has to pass through the fact of integration of knowledge. And we are a society that has more data and more knowledge than ever, and less capable to solve problems in an integrated manner than ever. So I think that's very important. The scientists have to understand that uh, the social challenges are huge, uh, and every tiny bit of knowledge they can contribute with, with any type of experience they have at different scales, where we have governance issues, where we have social issues, and we have uh, a way, and where we can discover new things mm -hmm. is fundamental for solving global challenges. So, so I think uh, it's important to, again, you know, those days I'm repeating myself so much that I feel a bit stupid, but uh, we need a spaces for everyone to be recognized as part of the solution in science. And uh, we need the spaces uh, for dialogue, we need the spaces from brainstorming, I'm really missing that. You know, I'm, 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 I'm deeply embedded by bureaucracy and by project-based approaches that are consuming most of our time. While I'm really missing is space for discussion, a space for mentoring, a space for sharing the experiences of the ones that we are old, right, um, with the young scientists. And um, I think that's fundamental. And with uh, these, we will increase the awareness that uh, they are, um, you know, useful for society. Um, I have some experiences recently in my own institute where, you know, people is declaring that they feel uh, important. They, they don't see how they can contribute. I think this is a very bad sign. Mm -hmm. uh, if they don't recognize them, themselves as part of the solution, even if the contribution is very tiny, we are not really fulfilling our function in society. Thank you. Claire, in the, you know, in the spectrum of funding provided by the European Commission, in particular in the, in the framework programs, there's always been this very clear distinction between the targeted ones, whatever they're going for, you know, whether it's health, whether it's society, whether it's uh, blue, you know, whichever sort of target there is. Now, in the mix of all that, there's Marie Curie, the bottom-up program. So how do you see that the Marie Skodowska Curie actions can contribute to global challenges in science in foreign policy? Well, as I said, I don't see a contribution between the fact that the MSCA is a bottom-up program and that it wouldn't contribute to, um, to big uh, global challenges. Uh, MSCA is a program with a very rich scientific content uh, and it's not only a, you know, a, a, a program that promotes only the mobility of researchers. And how do we do that? How do we ensure that our researchers contribute to these, uh, these challenges? First of all, as I mentioned, we offer the, possibi the, the possibility to, have, to participate in, in placement, in second months, not only to, um, to um, academic organizations, but non-academic organizations, including all sorts of policy-making bodies. Uh, together with the GRC, so the Joint Research Center of the Commission, we've organized already twice in a row um, an, an event that has become now an annual event where we bring together representatives from national, regional, or local uh, public bodies together with uh, potential uh, future applicants, future applicants to MSCA, to bring them together and hoping that we will develop future collaborative um, projects, so allowing them to present uh, both the uh, national or the, the, the um, public administration uh, present their, their needs and um, hoping that amongst the uh, people, the, the, the young scientists who participate in these events, there could be a sort of match-making uh, uh, possibility. Uh, you've heard uh, this morning when Lorenzo told us that the, uh, under Horizon 2020 there, were on, there was only 1% of the non-academic partners that were from you know, public administration, but under Horizon Europe we see that this percentage has already raised to 7%, so I think that events like this have an important role to play in raising awareness about the fact that MSCA can also promote cooperation with, uh, pu with, uh, with public bodies. Uh, we're working as well on showcasing the uh, impact of, um, 
of MSCA uh, in different um, thematic fields. And this is why what we call the uh, feedback to policy that we've started a few years ago and trying to see not only in a quantita quali quantitative way, but also a qualitative way, uh, trying to show how uh, the MSCA project contributes to uh, different um, policies of the EU, for example, the research and innovation missions, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Green Deal. We've organized as well what we call cluster meetings, where we bring together policymakers working on specific fields together with our researchers. We've done one on, uh, um, on the Green Deal, on uh, fighting against cancer, on uh, artificial intelligence, for example. And in 2021, there was a study um, carried out by uh, independent uh, expert, experts um, looking at the, um, all the publications that had been uh, done uh, with uh, projects funded under the uh, Research and Innovation Program on the issue of coronavi coronavirus and the COVID-19. Uh, COVID and we saw that uh, out of 3,000 publications, uh, most of these publications were coming from, of course, the health part of the program, but MSCA and the ERC, the European Research Council. So without imposing um, thematic priorities, we see that nevertheless, our researchers are tackling um, topics which, which are global challenges. And uh, I'd like to say that this work that we, are, we have started on feedback to policy, it's very uh, time and resource intensive. So this is why we have launched uh, we will launch uh, at the beginning of next year a new call uh, for proposals to have an external organization helping us map uh, all these uh, scientific fields and the contribution that MSCA uh, makes to these um, important uh, global challenges. Thank you. I'm going, to, I'm going to stick with you for a moment because I was just, just taking that to the next step and wondering how could you see policy being better integrated into the Mary Sklodowska Curie actions? You know, for example, the way open science has been put in under, excel under the excellence criterion when the pr proposals are being evaluated, or indeed making it more explicit in the training requirements of, um, for, for researchers on the Mary Curie actions. So I think here there is a fine line between um, imposing a new requirement mm -hmm. and uh, respecting the bottom-up dimension of the program and you know, um, intro introducing a bit more uh, red tape. Because every time we want to introduce a new requirement linked, for example, to, uh, to the sustainability or to the uh, supervision, etc., we are told, okay, we're happy to have guidelines, but do not introduce new requirement uh, because the, our researchers are already uh, overwhelmed. So, uh, and the uh, bottom-up dimension of the program has been highlighted as, uh, the, let's say, the, 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 the most valued. Now, there has just been a mid-term evaluation of Horizon Europe, and this bottom-up dimension has been valued as really something that the researchers and the uh, research organization value the most. So, we have to be careful not to introduce maybe new requirements as the one that you've just uh, mentioned. However, um, we, we have a number of, uh, let's say, policy targeted action under MSCA, which are not only the five actions that were shown on the, uh, the, the slide this morning. We have what we call um, coordination and support action, where we are targeting our support. For example, we have one on to, um, for our international cooperation. We have one on academic freedom and the researchers at risk. Um, we have one on, on policy feedback, which allows us, on top of the more, let's say, bottom-up action, to a little bit um, have um, a more uh, policy-oriented uh, contribution. The, you mentioned the important, the basic feature of the uh, MSEA, which are, of course, this intersectoral uh, mobility and cooperation, the very good working conditions, etc., the uh, excellent uh, supervision. Um, and you mentioned open science, which is part of the excellence, um, uh, of the, uh, excellence uh, criterion when selecting projects. But this open science uh, includes uh, outreach, it includes uh, science uh, with, with, with and for citizens, uh, it includes uh, outreach beyond just um, society, but also um, to, to policy makers, uh, uh, how to influence policy making. If you look at the new... Um, 
um, work um, at the new, how you call it, the new um, 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 program guide for Horizon Europe, you will see that in, in the impact section there are uh, examples on how to um, influence policy making discussions on how to participate in, uh, in uh, national and, and international debates. So I would say that even though there is not a criterion which is called you know, contribution or, uh, to uh, policy making, I think it's already, it, it's already well covered there. And to give you an, a last example, we carried out a survey on uh, the um, green sustain on the, the let's say the sustainability of our projects because we've introduced a green charter recently, and we've asked our projects, are you aware of this green this green charter which introduces new let's say sustainable way of uh, carrying out uh, R and I, and less than 50% of the respondents were aware of this green charter, and less than 50% also were aware of the European Green Deal. And, but still, more than 60% said, okay, we are not aware, but we know that our organizations have put in place measures to make uh, 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 R&I activities more uh, sustainable. And what they are asking us is not necessarily to introduce a new criterion or to a new evaluation uh, criterion, but they are asking us, please provide us with more guidelines on how we can increase our practices. So what I would say is that I think Although it's not uh, mentioned as a criterion, it's already there. Okay, that's very clear. Is Askun, what do you think would, um, you know, taken into account what, um, what, what Claire said there, and something you mentioned as well about the fact that that person you mentioned, the microbiologist, they knew that what they, you know, if they spend time with you, this wouldn't be valued as part of their career. So what do you think is needed to help, you know, what are researchers missing to, to encourage them, to incentivize them, to engage more in science-informed type policy or addressing global challenges? Mm -hmm. Well, I was thinking when uh, listening to Claire uh, speaking that I can only agree with your idea that maybe it's not a good idea to include yet another um, criteria for the evaluation of individual uh, applications. And this brings me to the idea of professionalization. I mean, I don't think it's even doable, neither a good idea, to expect all of a sudden all the research community wanting to communicate with our policymakers on their individual capacity. It's asking you too much, and it would be crazy, a nightmare. Imagine, I mean, we are working with 350 uh, members of parliament. We have 120,000 researchers in the country. I mean, it, it doesn't even... So I think that it's good that uh, uh, the research community, we are aware that it's important that our research has an impact in policy making and that we are much more connected to the reality of our societies when doing research. Even the slightly more basic research, there's always a way to connect it somehow to, to the social reality. This is one thing. And another thing that I think is equally important is that we start professionalizing a little bit the concept of science advice. And I, I am optimistic because when I see the policy discussions at the European level, I can see that we are opening up a little bit the idea of addressing only researchers in our policy discussion to other type of science professionals. I mean, this, uh, in the new European research area, there's a particular action, uh, still in its infancy, but in, interesting itself, which is addressing research managers. At the moment, research manager is everything that isn't a researcher in an institution. There's much to be discussed and much to be, you know, uh, there's a huge taxonomy that needs to be developed. But the, for the first time, I want to see an interest in professions beyond research. And I think this is crucial because we, all of us, each of us has an, our own capacities, our own interests. Uh, there are people that are going to, that will, would love to be pure scientists and that's it. But we need to be creating different layers of um, professional, professionals that interact and create those spaces that Maria Jose was saying. And equally important, those layers need to be mobile. I mean, for instance, the team I was telling you about in, the, in, in our office, they were research, researcher until, researchers until two years ago. Now, if they wish to come back to academia, they are going to have a hard time. And you cannot believe your... I mean, it's unbelievable, right? Who on earth wouldn't be interested? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking on institutions. Who on earth 
wouldn't be interested in a researcher that has spent two years working for the Spanish parliament. They are going to have a hard uh, time if they are crazy enough to want to come back to academia. <laughs> so I think that those layers need to be mobile and we need to start defining better what a researcher is, what a research manager is, what a science advisor is. And I mean, without being rigid, but starting to, you know, to uh, create a, a much more rich ecosystem than the research community as a block. Okay. Maria Jose, would you have any other incentives you would see that would drive this? Well, I, 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 following what Ichazo uh, was saying, uh, Ichazo was saying, um, I, I think it's the, all those profiles she's describing are important. Um, there is a challenge on how to put them in an ecosystem that works together, mm, as well. uh, which recognize that pure scientists produce basic knowledge, which is very relevant, as well as other scientists can produce knowledge, which helps this basic knowledge to be put in a context uh, which is much more complex. So I think it, that's important. I would say, I wanted to say three sentences. Um, quantity, no, better quality. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's also important that the, there is a learning plus exposure cycle. I don't think that the scientific career is linear. I don't think it's an exponential career where uh, you start with zero publications and you end up with uh, 100 publications per year. Um, I think you need to be exposed uh, at some period to your career into the context where you want to contribute with the knowledge you want to produce. Um, and, and finally, I think uh, it is also very important that we give the opportunity to all scientists to be trained on soft skills. And, and, and some of them uh, will become you know, interested in the profiles that uh, Itaspun was mentioning. Uh, if we don't provide these opportunities, um, all scientists will follow this linear, uh, you know, uh, definition of scientific career we have now. I think she, she is right when she says that uh, many scientists, which could be extremely good on those profiles, are reluctant to continue, and they do sometimes very brief experiences, and then they say, "Oh, yeah, but now I don't know anything in depth, and therefore I'm not a scientist anymore. So I want mm -hmm. to go back." and be recycled into a specific issue. I think this is a mistake. I mean, we can afford to lose those profiles. But if we don't recognize the, the value of those profiles, then of course no one wants to do this, unless there's a rare animal that, like me that I don't really care, so I can do whatever I want, and it's not a problem for my career. But um, I think those are the things I, 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 I will say it summarizes. And, and I mean, the Marie Curie can offer the possibility to really build this ecosystem much better in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, so I really encourage the Commission to really go in that direction and, and try to ensure that everyone and all the scientific community and the policy making community and even the citizens understand that the science ecosystem is more than a scientist in the lab. Thank you very much, Maria Jose, because I think. We're going to move to a new thing, and I would see this as very positive news in the context of what we've discussed this morning. Now, hands, hands up of those of you who know about the European Researchers' Charter and Code of Conduct for the Recruitment. Right, there's going to be a new one. <laughs> well, there was a new proposal launched by the Commission in the summer. The good news is it will be decided by the Council of Ministers this December. So this is really positive news because it's along with the new concept of a new career, research career framework, which in fact, when you look at it, incorporates all of the statements, essentially the wish list, <coughs> excuse me, the wish list of uh, Isaskun, of Claire, and of Maria Jose this morning. And it really is a jump forward because it is now incorporating aspects of policy, including open science, research integrity, reformed research assessment, a very different view of <laughs> researchers. And, <clears throat> sorry to, to emphasize it, this is not just for Mary Skłodowska curie actions. This is a broad researcher's charter. So I think this, this will actually be very, and by chance, is Askun here, is one of the authors. She was very deeply involved in the drafting of this document. So 
is Asgun. What do you think now? What, what do you think of the elements now of this new charter that are really going to support mm -hmm. and incentivize researchers? Well, so to start with, I think that the piece of work that we worked on, the one that was written 15 years ago, was already very visionary and very nice piece of work and was already addressing some of the things that we are discussing. And what we have tried to do in this revamped version is to build on this uh, vision of, of the concept and by merely sometimes reorganizing the values, trying to explain that the Charter and Code is a vision for the European research values, mm -hmm. which might be <coughs> simple, but it's not. I mean, the way that uh, research is done in Europe is particular, and we need to put that into value. I mean, we are talking about open science, research freedom, uh, gender equality, research integrity. There's a number of values. I'm not saying that other regions are not also obeying these values, but are European for sure. And we wanted to put that together in the, in the first uh, chapter of the Charter and Code, to make us all aware that we are talking about a vision of, of a continent on how, how we do research. And the other thing that probably is also new, or at least it, it's, uh, it goes deep and into the idea of all these ideas that we've, we've been discussing about. I think it's the very first time that uh, the Charter and Code recon recognizes the concept of teamwork. We were discussing the, the concept of teamwork, we were discussing it for a few meetings uh, among member states and we really wanted to put that in, on the table because um, for this particular issue we are talking, uh, addressing global challenges, there's no single researcher is going to be able to do it alone and we need to start thinking on a, on a way of working which is uh, teamwork. It can be dreamy but I, I honestly believe that it's the only way that we can, we can address this. And by recognizing this idea of teamwork in the, in the Charter and Code, it's one more brick into, into building this, this new concept of doing research in Europe. And I think that's pretty um, attractive. Good, good. Claire. Now, one of, the, one of the aspects of the new Charter and Code is, is, is essentially a reformed research assessment. And this, of course, is based on the Coalition for Research Assessment that started over a year ago. Now, one of the, one of the aspects here I think could be quite interesting, and I'm just, I'd like your opinion on that, and now is that in research assessment, it says support for evidence-informed policy making is going to be incorporated. So do you see you know, that that really will help change how things are done? Well, I do. I think it's a, it's a really a good step in the in the right direction. We, we need to see as well now concretely how this work of researchers, you know, their, their attempt to uh, collaborate and to contribute to policy making, how will it be rewarded in organisations? I think we, this will be the next steps. I think it will be interesting to see how this will be rewarded. As you said, the MSCA has at uh, its uh, heart uh, the, the, the 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 charter. Uh, and uh, the Code of Conduct for the Recruitment of Researchers. And uh, it has, I think, it's really thanks to MSCA that these, the, the principles of the Charter have been uh, known, have been uh, spread, have been used in uh, organization, uh, not only within an MSCA, and, uh, and, but, but much, much wider. And we will continue to support, obviously, the revised version and the updated version of the Charter. And when it comes to COAHA and to the new... Um, way uh, research is assessed. I would say that in MSCA, it was already, always the case. I think MSCA has always recognized the diverse dimension of a researcher's career and the diverse outputs of their work. So mm -hmm. both as, um, as uh, mentors, as, um, as a teacher sometimes, I mean, as uh, preparing applications, etc., etc., contributing, I mean, communicating with policymakers, uh, putting in practice open science practices. This has always been the case when evaluating um, uh, the um, profile of researchers. We were not only looking, not at all, at their, only at their publications. So I think that MSK has always, um, let's say, uh, applied these principles and will continue to do so. Um, I mentioned, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think that if you look at the program guide of Horizon Europe, you will see that the, uh, the, the policy contributions are rewarded in the impact uh, 
under the impact criterion. So uh, there is a long list of different ways in which researchers can contribute to policy making. And there has been as well a shift between Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe in the way the issue of uh, valorization and dissemination is, is perceived. I think in the past, this was seen as something that was happening at the end of the project. You, you do your project, and at the end, you will do something a bit, you know, to disseminate the results. Now, the issue of communication you know, to a wider public, disseminating the results should take place at the very outset of the project. There has been really, I think, a mentality mm -hmm. shift uh, between the two programs. Uh, finally, uh, I think we mentioned communication. Um, it's, uh, we are really uh, pushing very much, I mean, you know that there is a strong skills development and training dimension to the MSCA, and uh, the, um, let's say, communication to policymakers, to society, I think it's one of the, uh, this guy, this been discussing with some of our, the young researchers who are here today, I hope that most of them went through this type of, uh, of training on how to communicate, you know, to policymakers knowing that they're very often not speaking the same language. And we also are sometimes organizing this type of training for our uh, researchers, and, 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 and this is something as well that we need to, 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 to develop further in the future. Thank you. And just before we move now to questions, I'd just like to make one point, which is really interesting. Is Askun talked about the new charter has been developed within Europe, but the OECD released a report this summer on research, research careers, etc. And remember, the OECD includes countries like Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, um, Japan, United States, Canada, so it's a much broader research community. They have seven recommendations. When I read the seven recommendations, I just thought, hey, this is the new charter. <laughs> There's very little difference. There, there really is a congruence between the two. So what, you know, what we talk about in Europe, what we see there. Now, it's not to say there are other systems, there are other, there are other countries, there are other countries which struggle to retain their researchers to bring them back, but that's a whole other discussion. But the point is that the key underlying issues around research careers are global. Now, Michele, are you going to come up and join us here? Because it's now your opportunity to ask questions. Okay, okay so there's time, for, there's time for one question from the floor and one question for the Mentimeter. We have only five minutes left, so I will start with the question from the Mentimeter. Okay, so there is a question for Claire, in fact, mentioning the Science and Enterprise panel. It was a success, the, the, the person that is, asked the, is asking the question says the science and entrepreneur, uh, sorry, the science and enterprise panel was a successful tool for increasing non-academic participation. Why has it been stopped? And are there any considerations to bring it back in the next framework program? Thank you. <laughs> and whoever wants to ask a question, please raise your hand. Yes. Well, uh, I mean, we see that there has not been a drop in the participation of uh, enterprises since we stopped this panel. I mean, it's a different way of uh, doing it, but even without this panel, we are seeing an increase in the number of the participation of non-academic partners, including enterprises. So we have found, let's say, different ways of increasing the participation of uh, non-academic partners and enterprises, including through financial incentives, including through um, promoting much more, for example, the industrial uh, doctoral programs. We do it in a different way, but we see that we ha there, there is no drop in the number of uh, uh, enterprises in the, uh, participating in the MSCA. Okay, thanks. So any questions from the floor? Okay, otherwise there is one more from the Mentimeter. This is not for anybody in particular, so whoever can, can reply. Any advice on how to motivate individual researchers in fields with high employability rates, for example, machine learning, who get snatched by high paying companies to pursue a career in policy? Yeah, well, we, we are suffering from that problem because uh, in our institute we are developing a new technology um, based on semantics and artificial intelligence, and so we need, uh, you know, highly qualified uh, programmers. And of course, uh, they have get much better salaries uh, in the private sector, which doesn't have this vision at all, but rather more 
selling you in the internet things uh, through artificial intelligence. So um, what we have been doing is basically providing them more flexibility, uh, more uh, space uh, for developing their own ideas. And what we get is basically people that is, is been working on the private sector. They are really tired of the environment in the private sector and they come to us and find a much more enabler environment for creativity. So I think there are ways to incentivate that uh, obviously are not only the salary. Uh, we will never be able to compete with industry salaries. So we have to find other ways that, uh, let's say, improve the welfare of these people. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. So I would say maybe there's time for one very short final statement from each one of the panelists, if you want, and, and then we move to the next section. May I? Please, yes, please. Is good. Well, I, I just wanted to reinforce how Connor started this panel, and I wanted to congratulate uh, Marie Slodowska Curie Actions for, for taking, you know, the opportunity to discuss about these issues because it's there's certainly a momentum, and you couldn't miss it. And I really hope that you find ways to to integrate science for policy and better addressing global challenges within the program. And I think you you decided to to run this conference in the perfect moment. So congratulations. <laughs> great. Thanks a lot. I think that is a great closing for the panel. So thank you for, and let's thank again the panelists.